Welcome, welcome, welcome. A notable welcome to all you music lovers. To something that I like to call Journey to the Stage. It's all about music. Music. And more music. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back your host. Your host. And our dad. Brian. Fraser. Fraser. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. All right, welcome everybody to Journey to the Stage. I'm Brian Frazier, and I'm so glad you've pulled up a chair to join us today. And thank you for making Journey to the Stage part of your podcast rotation. With your help, we are reaching an audience in over 130 countries, and that is really, really exciting to me. And I'm very grateful for how you've spread the word and, and shared with your friends. Thank you for doing all of that. And if any kind reviews you give are always appreciated, so let's welcome our guest today. Ensconced in the artist's throne is multi-instrumentalist, songwriter, vocalist, and producer, Stephen McCarthy. I first became familiar with Stephen's work uh, when he joined the Jayhawks for their 2003 album, Rainy Day Music, and the subsequent tour, and then got to know his main band, The Long Riders. And they have a brand new album out. It's just out. It's called September and November. We're going to be playing a great song from that in just a few minutes. And I'm uh, getting into a, a project that Steven's been working on with songwriter, singer, and producer Carla Olson. So we've got a lot to talk about, some great music ahead of us. Let's get our conversation started. So Steven, welcome to Journey to the Stage. It's really great to have you here. Thanks, Brian. It's great to be with you today. So you're in Virginia. Are you guys still in uh, in winter mode? You know, we're sort of in this in-between period, and it's the weather is really crazy. It's freezing. We had a frost warning yesterday. And mm-hmm. then uh, later in the day, it was sunny. People are in short sleeves. So we normally <laughs> don't plant until April 7th around here. So, um, yeah, the weather's crazy all over the place. But uh, it's, it's, it's basically pretty nice. And so that's that's home for you. You you were born and raised there. You moved to California, as we were just talking about before we re- we started recording. And then you're back there. How long have you been back in in Virginia? Well, I've been back a long time. I've been moved back over thirty years ago, and oh, okay. um, I was in L.A. for all of the 1980s. And that's of course where the Long Riders started, and I played with a few of the groups and a lot of session work. But yeah, yeah, Virginia is home, and um, it's really where I, I I grew up, and I'm I'm very comfortable here. So it's, it's and Richmond's a very nice town to live in. Yeah, beautiful. And I know you've been really busy. As uh, I know, just as we were corresponding before uh, we connected today, you've got lots of projects going, and so I'm I'm really looking forward to digging into some of those. And before we do that, I want to pull the lens back a little bit, uh, just for a few minutes, and. You know, I've had the the pleasure of talking with lots of really great artists and musicians like yourself. And one of the themes that has emerged really almost universally is that the music in their childhood home, the music you know that they grew up with, has played a significant part in shaping them as as writers and uh, as as players. So take us back a little bit to those early days for you musically. What were what was that like for you? Yes, that's a great question. And I would totally agree with that because that music that you grew up with really informs your outlook and influences, you know, where you're going to go musically if you decide to become a musician. So my father was from New York City. He passed away a long time ago. My mother was a Midwest farm gal. and They met in Washington, D.C., and then they moved down to Richmond in the 50s. So I am the youngest of four my oldest brother, this is kind of funny because my oldest brother was totally into Motown, you know, Otis Redding or Aretha Franklin yeah. Temptations, you know, and he was mm-hmm. going to see all those groups and he'd come through town. My next older brother was, he wasn't really into that. He was totally into Jan and Dean and the Beach Boys and kind of surf music. So I got yeah, that wow. from him. Mm-hmm. My sister was more sort of British Invasion and all those sorts of groups. So, and she saw the uh, Beatles play at Chase Stadium in the mid sixties. Really? Oh yeah. my! Yeah. Yeah, August of sixty five, I believe. And uh, I was up there. I was in the car with her. We, you know, uh, we went fishing. We dropped her off. My sister Susan and our cousin Elizabeth. They were like thirteen and fourteen. They went in to see the mm-hmm. Beatles, and we went off fishing in Long Island Flound, uh, Long Island Sound for <laughs> flounder. So, wow. yeah, I was very disappointed, but 
as a seven or, seven or eight year old, you're not going to really get in to see uh, to see the Beatles when it's nearly impossible to get a ticket. So, so that right. was basically what I was listening to because you know you weren't old enough to go out and buy records, and so you're listening to your brothers and sisters' record collection. And my parents, mm -hmm. my mom played the piano quite well, and she would be playing just sort of standards or yeah classical music. My dad didn't play, but he loved to sing Irish ballads, so I would hear that around the house quite a bit also. Well, you had great fortune then to have such a variety of of styles and genres and and sounds. That's that's pretty cool. I, I, it must have been fun to walk down your childhood hallway and hear all this different music coming from different bedrooms. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it was. It was really nice. And just the pop radio of the day was really varied. You know, you'd hear a Beach Boys song on the top forty, mm -hmm. top ten. You know, then you'd hear an Aretha song. And then you'd hear a surf instrumental and then you'd hear, you know, it was so varied. And I wish things were like that still. I absolutely can hear, hear you on that one. Do you remember the first time you, you picked up a guitar or is, or is guitar the first instrument you played? Cause I know you play pretty much anything with strings. Was that your first instrument? Yes. Guitar was my first instrument and I got a 12 string, not a great one, but I got a 12 string in the late sixties. A dear friend of mine played around the corner and his older brother played who I still know. And he was showing us chords and whatnot. And my next door neighbor had a band and they actually, he gave me a guitar that I still have, a Harmony really? Stratotone. Yeah, it's yellow huh. and uh, it's from 1957. I still have that guitar. It's the first guitar I ever got, my first electric guitar. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, it started off on guitar. And then uh, in the 70s, well, actually, I went to bass guitar after that. I was always the youngest guy, so in the bands that I played in, they were looking around for someone to play bass, someone to play drums. I would just say, well, hey, well, I'll get a set. I'll get a set of drums. I'll be the drummer or I'll be the bass player. So I played a few different things before I moved out to L.A. Well, and how important that would be to be able to sit behind any instrument and feel comfortable, at least somewhat comfortable. And I think that would help you to be a better writer, a better studio musician, all those things. I'm sure that was really, really helpful for you. You were cutting your teeth musically in a period where there were some great guitarists. I mean, you, you've you operated more on, on the country side, but maybe a little more on the country spectrum with you know what we now call Americana, things like that. What was it that drew you as a player maybe over to that side a little bit more than maybe more of the straightforward rock side that was, you know, really predominant through that British invasion you were talking about and some of the other great American music? Yeah, I was really drawn to that sort of country guitar, or I guess you could call it country rock guitar. The two things that stand out in my mind, I saw the first Eagles tour. And I wasn't oh, wow. necessarily a huge Eagles fan. I thought they were okay, you know, and certainly mm -hmm. they were very successful. But Bernie Ledden was playing guitar. I remember he was standing stage right, and I was kind of drawn to the sound he was getting out of his guitar. And I knew he had played with the Flying Burrito Brothers before that. And I was like, what is that contraption? It sounds like a steel guitar. And it was a, a B-bender that he was playing. And then just a, a couple of years later, I saw the Earl Scruggs review and his son Randy he had like a palm pedal on his guitar. And I was like, what is the, he, how is he getting that sound? And I just was really drawn to that. And then, you know, listening after that to, uh, you know, James Burton or Albert Lee, you know, all those great country pickers. And so, yeah, yeah that was a, def, a definite influence. And when I got to LA, I got to be friends with and play with uh, Pete Anderson, who produced and played guitar on all those early Dwight Yoakam records. So it's another wow. big influence. You know, kind of going back to those early days as a player, do you remember the first stage that you took? And do you remember kind of what you felt as you were going into that moment? Playing live for the first time? Yeah, you know, where you actually, you know, not just for a family thing, but going up on a stage and, you know, with whether it's with the band or doing something on your own. Do you, do you kind of remember that and what, what that feeling was like for you? Well, yeah, it was definitely exciting to play, even if you're playing covers, being with your friends and playing at a party, a pool party, or playing at someone's house, you definitely felt like you were kind of what we were saying earlier, taking your your influences from your your record collection or your brothers and sisters' record collection, your parents, and that's being sort of distilled down 
into this form that you can play music by was it the Beatles or George Jones or whatever, and then eventually that style kind of like melts in and becomes something of your own. You add your own ingredient in there. As a Virginian, obviously you talked about being born and raised there, but really was in LA where you started your recording career. I mean, it's obviously where the long rider started. What was it that prompted you to change coasts and uh, what, what was the impetus of that? Well, I was playing in a country band here in Richmond and we actually had a couple of friends, but we had a guy named Bucky Baxter who went on to play pedal steel with Bob Dylan for a number of years. He played with Steve Earle. Oh, wow. uh, great mm. player. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago. But the uh, singer of the band, a guy named James Morgan, and his wife were moving to L.A. And he said, hey, you know, you want to come with us? We'll go out there. We'll play some and we'll see what we can get going on out there. And so I was pretty young. I said, sure. Yeah, let's go. And so we played out on this country circuit. It was the cir same circuit that Dwight Yoakam and a bunch of other guys were on. And Dwight, oh, wow. you know, came out of that pretty quick. But that's where I met Pete Anderson and uh, Pete. This was before the Long Rider started. It was before Pete joined up with Dwight. So I was thinking about this just the other day because you probably heard the news about the drummer Jim Gordon passing away. Famous guy. It was a terrible, terrible story. But uh, Pete brought Jim Gordon out to play with us, you know, four or five times. And so here I am as, you know, like a 22-year-old playing bass. And I'm, pl <laughs> I'm playing with Jim Gordon. And I my mind was kind of blown because he's like in his mid thirties by this time mm -hmm. and a very accomplished player played on tons of hit records, just tons and tons of hits. And I'm thinking, how am I playing with this guy? Well, he was sort <laughs> of, you know, he was having some difficulties in his life. I didn't know that at the time, but it was only a year from when he had his psychotic break and, and committed that terrible crime and, and of course was in, jail, was in jail ever since. Just sort of an aside, but we played that that circuit and the Palomino was, mm, was yeah. a great bar, you may recall, in, in North Hollywood. Sure. And just, you know, besides the grand old, the old Grand Ole Opry and um, in Nashville, that was like the place to play. And uh, we would play there uh, you know, a handful of times and, and once again, pretty long riders. Well, that's exciting. And what a, what a great time to be in LA. Not only was the country scene just really, really vibrant and on fire, but so was the rock scene. So you had so much music really LA was such a hub for great, great music in that period of time. So yeah, that was a great time for you to be here. Well, as you well know. Yeah. There were actually two different scenes that we were part of. There was one that I really I mean, they were both great, but the one that I was really into, into was the uh, Roots Rock scene. It had a lot of bands like The Blasters and Rank and File and uh, Los Lobos, uh, Lone Justice, oh, yeah. a bunch of groups like that. They were sort of country-influenced, mm -hmm. um, and we played with those bands quite often. On the other hand, there was another scene called, that they called the Paisley Underground, which was great, too. It was the, the Bangles and the Rain Parade and Dream Syndicate and Green on Red, a lot of those groups. So we could kind of go from both of those different scenes and um, great memories of all those old days. Yeah. How would you describe that sound? Because when Long Riders got together, was it like 81, 82? Right. The Paisley Underground, like that's that's a phrase I hadn't actually been familiar with until I was doing my, my preparation for our discussion. But I didn't realize that was a label that was given to that early sound you guys had what how would you describe that maybe to somebody who's not familiar with that because it's it's a really interesting combination of sounds how would you describe that to somebody maybe who doesn't know well i think that it was a lot of these bands who had their own sound but they were all influenced to a degree by the music of the 1960s a lot of the los angeles it could be sunset strip or laurel canyon mm -hmm. sounds you know country and pop music coming together, a lot of harmonies could be, you know, Love and Spoonful. It could be the Birds was was a band yeah. a lot of people pointed to. Um, mm -hmm. Great harmonies. The Bangles would have harmonies, uh, you know, Mamas and the Papas, things like that. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of these groups played together and socialized together. And 
So that's what I would say, you know, it was kind of that Sunset Strip 1960s sounds that a lot of the bands were were kind of going after with a modern twist of the time, you know, with sort of post-punk energy attached to that. Yeah, and, and that was often felt really through the rhythm section and the way yes. the song was approached. And so, yeah, you know, roughly 81, it's you and Sid Griffin and Des Brewer and Tom Stevens, Greg Souders. You guys get together. How did that happen? How did the the long riders come into uh, to being a band? Yeah, Barry Shank also. I'm not sure if you mentioned his oh, name. Barry. But he he was there at the very beginning before the uh, first album was made. But he had a few songs with the long riders. A great guy. He's now a professor at, at Ohio State. The way the band kind of came together, Sid was in a band called the Unclaimed in L.A., and Greg was in a band called the Box Boys. Sid and uh, Barry and were in the unclaimed and they put an advertisement in this paper called the recycler looking for a guitar player. And I think it said the influences were Buffalo Springfield meets the clash or something like that. And wow. I saw that and I thought, okay, I can do that. And so I went down there, I borrowed an electric guitar and I borrowed an amp from somebody and went down there, you know, something of an audition and I played and, but yeah, we started off from there, and Sid was working at a uh, at a company called uh, PVC Records, and they ended up putting out our first EP that we recorded with Earl Mankey. What is really, really interesting is that you guys really were doing something that was unique, and I think because you had those influences that are in some ways very far apart on the spectrum, but you put them together in a, made, in a way that really worked, and it created something quite unique. You created something that really was kind of at the cutting edge of what we now, you know, was it for a while known as alt country and then, you know, more of Americana is what we call it today. You guys influenced a lot of bands, Uncle Tupelo and old 97s and even the Jayhawks, you know, maybe in the, they came about in the mid eighties. But so you guys were really kind of trailblazers in what we now call Americana. That's pretty fascinating. I actually go back for a second. I said PBC, I think Jim Records was where Sid was working. It was just a style that kind of came naturally to us. Um, I think, I, like I mentioned, I brought in a little bit more of the country sound, and those guys were, Sid had played in some punk rock bands, and so we had this, that great energy, and Greg played in this band, the Box Boys, that had sort of ska influences. So we threw wow. all this stuff in the yeah. pot, and it kind of comes out as, as the early long riders. And, of course, we got Tom Stevens by the second record, and he brought in another great sound, you know, rock and roll and country music. You're not really thinking about it that much. You're just sort of doing it. And it naturally right, right. evolves. And you got all these different guys and getting back to the record collections and what they listened to growing up and what informed them. Mm -hmm. So you put it all in the mix and it, it kind of comes out how it comes out. And so we were pretty happy about that. One of the things I learned as I was prepping is that you guys were label mates with you too you were on island records yeah we did two records with them mm -hmm. yeah state of our union and two fisted tales yeah we were signed by the same guy nick stewart signed you too he signed the long riders i think he signed killing joke and uh yeah we're still friends with nick and that was a great label i mean there there's some great things and there were some, some things that weren't great but um that's right. kind of the same story no matter what label you're on one of the things i read is that you guys had a chance to jump out on the road with them for a, a stretch or a leg of their tour and it didn't quite work out. And one of the biggest what ifs, I mean, if you can imagine being part of that Joshua tree tour back in, what was that? 80, 88, 89, something like that. That would have been <laughs> pretty amazing. Yeah. They had asked us to play and, and, you know, I think the band was sort of on the first go around. We were starting to, to splinter. And I remember going up and uh, we met with the head of the label, Chris Blackwell and he, our record was supposed to come out. I don't know what it was, maybe like a week or two after their big album, uh, Joshua Tree. And we mm -hmm. said to the label head, like, this is just going to crush us. They're such a big band. He said, no, 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 it'll be fine. They'll blow open the doors and you'll come marching through after them. And well, <laughs> it didn't quite work out that way, but <laughs> you know, yeah, we were going to do that tour, but it just it just never happened. So, yeah. you know, and the band was about on its last legs anyways. Yeah, and so after your third album, Two-Fisted Tales, it seems like all, all of these things were kind of converging with what was going on in Ireland and maybe some just 
personnel type stuff. And that kind of led to you guys going your, your separate ways. And it's, it's interesting because I've had two recent interviews. One was with um, Dan Murphy from Soul Time. I don't know if you, you, you maybe have met Dan before, you know. Part yeah, of yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. And the other one recently was with um, Glenn Phillips from Toe the Wet Sprocket. And they both shared how difficult it is to keep a band together. It's difficult for guys to spend that much time with different personalities, maybe somewhat different goals and people change over time. It's tough to be cohesive and keep moving in the same direction. You guys, after your third album, you called it a day. You you, and you guys uh, obviously would eventually get back together. But you know, now that you guys are making music and stuff, and we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about the new album. Have you found that, you know, as you guys are maybe a little older, that it, that it's easier to be a band and maybe some of those old things that were such a big deal back then maybe are a little easier now with some perspective and some some wisdom? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that when you're young, you're kind of all over the place. You're really scattered. You want to play with a lot of different people and you probably get restless easier so it's been really kind of nice and to sort of address the point about the second half of the career here uh we were playing if you want to get into this we were playing in new york and uh and i said to sid we were talking about some more touring and i said hey if we're going to play anymore we have got to do another record i you know i love all the old songs but we've got to have something new to say and something new to sing about and uh he was a little bit reluctant at first, thinking that, oh, if we do another record, we had to do like a reunion album, and it's not good or just subpar, then it's going to kind of ruin, you know, our reputation and our legacy. Right, right. So I said, well, no, no, we, we, it'll be good. I guarantee you, we'll, we'll do something mm-hmm. good. And if we do something that's terrible, we just, we just won't put it out. So that kind of boosted us to, uh, to play more and to want to do more recording and play uh, to tour. You know, we felt really good about that album that came out. Uh, it was recorded in 2017, and uh, we can talk about that in a minute. During that time period where you were kind of off from the Long Riders, is that when you met Carla Olson, or how did how did your paths cross? Yes, yeah, so I had met Carla with she was playing with the Textones, it's sort of like '86 or so, and mm-hmm. she and her husband Saul Davis they had in, invited me to come play on a record that she was doing with uh Gene Clark called So Rebellious a Lover. So mm-hmm. I came in and met them and played some guitar and some dobro on that album. And it was great getting to meet Gene and hang with him. Actually, I actually met Gene before that. He came in to sing on a long rider song called Ivory Tower and he and I sang on that and that was that was a real thrill to meet him. And then to get to work with him again a few years later was great. And Carla is a dear friend and a really talented singer, songwriter, producer. We talked about doing more recording or doing an album, and it took a few decades, but we finally did that, which was released just at the end of last wow. year. It is a beautiful album, and that's that's interesting. I had no idea that it took so long, and I know what that's like, you know, you because she's busy with producing, and she's obviously has her own successful career, and you've been doing all kinds of different things. So that must make it all the more sweet that you guys have finally been able to put out this album and it's a beautiful one. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that, uh, and this goes for the long riders also, or for anyone that you're playing with or recording with writing with. When I was in LA, it was great because you could just call somebody up. You could go over to their house, sit on the couch and you have that immediate contact and back and forth. You're writing with someone, but when you move 3000 miles away and you're still (laughs) collaborating with friends, of course, Sid moved even further. He moved all the way over to London. So with Carl, yeah, it was a challenge in that uh, recording and writing during COVID, being separated long distance. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, we were able to make the record somehow. They, those I'll credit Carla and her husband for staying after the idea and finally making it happen. Well, and it's one you can be proud of. It, it it's It's a really, really good album. So we're going to play a cut from it. This is Night Comes Fallen from the album of the same name by Stephen McCarthy and Carla Olson. And we'll chat about it here in a second. Shadows will fall 
I really, really enjoyed the blending of your voices. There, there is something really, really cool with the way your voices uh, relate to each other and work and intertwine with each other. Really, really nice job. It's a great song. What can you tell us about about that song in particular, the title track? Yeah, so the story behind that is that uh, Carl and I were invited to sing a song at this Wild Honey tribute, which is an autism benefit that's held in L.A. each year, Paul Rock. Oh, okay. And they have a band. There's a theme every year, and it's either the Beach Boys or a lot of older groups. Uh, this particular year, it was, it was Buffalo Springfield. And we got together, and we were in the rehearsal room, and I asked Carl, I said, do you ever think about Gene Clark? And she said, well, I do. I have these dreams about him occasionally, but he's never saying anything. And I thought about that. And when I got back home, I was starting to write something down, some some lyrics, and come up with a chord progression. And Carla chimed in. She added a number of things. So that was really sort of the impetus. That was the starting off point for for the uh, inspiration for the album. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm really proud of the record. I, I love the way it came out, and uh, 
It's gotten some nice reviews. Everyone, you can find that just by searching for Stephen's name on where, wherever you listen to music, and it's Stephen with a PH, and uh, it'll it'll pop right up. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. What does it draw out in you as a, as a as a player, maybe as a writer, as an artist, to be able to work with somebody, whether it's Carla or any other writers or musicians you've had the the opportunity to work with? What does that do for you personally and professionally? Like, what does that draw out of you? I think that musicians who work full time, it's it's kind of like what they do, it's their thing. You sort of somehow seem destined to do that. That seems to be your focus in life. And if you're at the grocery store or you're riding down the street on your bike or whatever, there's probably a tune that's in your head or a lyric or you hear something that someone has said and you write it down. It just seems to always inform your your day or your your thoughts and it depends on who you're playing with what the project is are you being hired just as a guitar player are you being hired to sing backgrounds harmonies are you writing with somebody so depending on the situation and what you're bringing to it it's uh i don't know i find it not in a bad way but it's sort of all all consuming you know during that period of time when the long writers weren't weren't playing you connected with the Jayhawks, which is how I discovered you as a, as a musician through the rainy day music album for the Jayhawks. And then the subsequent tour, how did you get connected with the Jayhawks? Well, I had known those guys a little bit for a long time. In fact, Mark Olson, who was in the early Jayhawks years, Mm -hmm. um, he had actually come over and we had talked about having him play in the long riders at one time. We were looking for a bass player. Oh, really? Yeah. This is before Tom Stevens. I mean, it was really a thing that lasted a couple of days, but he came over to my apartment in Santa Monica, and then he said, oh, you know what? I'm I'm going to move back up to Minnesota, and that's kind of when they got their band going. So I knew him a bit in L.A. in those early days. We played a show with them at uh, First Avenue in Minneapolis on, on our first tour. Yeah, I liked what they were doing. I thought, wow, Gary's a great singer. They've got cool songs, great guitar player. Mm-hmm. And so many years later... I'd moved back here and he called me up and said, Hey, you know, we've got a new record coming out and our new rec- record we're recording in LA. Why don't you come on out and, uh, and record with us? So that's kind of how that got going. Um, I went up and I played with them first in Minneapolis. I guess they want to make sure I could still play. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, yeah. Gary's been a great friend, the whole band, you know, they're, they're super, a really talented group of people. And, um, on that record, I was, one of the highlights of my career really was getting to sing with with Gary and Tim O'Regan singing harmonies on that first record that I played on with them, uh, Rainy Day Music. So yeah, just just great stuff. And I toured with them quite a bit. You know, two different periods, like twenty years apart. So I never was a real member of the band. I was kind of touring with them, but I did play on a couple of albums. And that's a great album. And you play, man, you play a lot of different instruments on that on that album. Pretty much everything with strings, yeah. It's a uh, it's a special one. And that tour, you guys played quite a bit. As I mentioned, I uh, in our pre chat, I I caught the tour when it came through Anaheim at the House of Blues, and it was, it was the Jayhawks, uh, the Thorns, and Carla Warner. What a roster of talent there! And I I loved the Thorns, Tina's Matthew Sweet and Pete Droge and, and Sean Mullins. What was that tour like? Do you remember you know any highlights from? all those days in the bus and uh you know because you you guys were on the road quite a bit you guys did quite a stretch of shows yeah we did some touring in the states and and uh, i was with them a few times over in europe playing i i would say one of the highlights was getting to play austin city limits with the band so oh, yes uh, oh right i forgot about that show yeah, yeah. and um uh, and we did a few tv things david letterman and conan o'brien so those those were fun to do yeah just just a great band and you know in the long riders i don't I play some pedal steel on on the records or lap steel, mm-hmm. but I never play. Well, rarely have I played it live because I'm up there strumming a the guitar, or singing, and playing. And steel is something you know you're sort of dedicated to. Like you're sitting in a chair and you're playing, and you're not really singing. So I yeah I love doing that with with them. Early days, I think I played some banjo with them. Or just I love being a, a utility guy. I love being a guy to just add some color. You know. If you can do that, I mean, because my heroes were sort of like Sneaky Pete, you know, guys like that, Lloyd Green. Not that I could play like them, but I really, I really loved 
if you listen to old Flying Burrito Brothers records, I kind of dial into the pedal steel. Or if you listen to Bird's records, uh, Sweetheart of the Rodeo, I'm listening to Lord Green or J.D. Manis. You know, I, I love that that sound brings to the albums. That was fun to get to do that with the Jayhawks. And then, you know, they called it a day after that. And I, you know, I, at least for a while, they, there, there was no Jayhawks. And I was, I was so defeated because they, they've always been one of my favorite bands. And, but it's been cool because you've been able to do, I think over the years, plug in some dates here and there and, and pop up with some shows there with them periodically. So that's kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, I played quite a bit with them right in the middle of COVID of all things. We would play in Colorado. They don't, tour for long stretches anymore they might go out and play three dates or three to five dates you know and would be like up in the in the northwest or in the northeast or down to texas whatever so i did join up with them quite a bit last year and their most recent record i'm playing on a few songs on that so uh right xoxo yeah, yeah. it's great to to catch up with them again yeah so also during that period you know kind of when the long artists were on hiatus you formed your own band and you you definitely kept yourself busy. You were playing with the Dream Syndicate, which I didn't know with Steve. I, I love Dream Syndicate. I'm a huge fan of their work. I don't know Steve's solo work as much, and that's something that I need to, to dig more into. But I didn't realize until I was prepping that Steve was around in those early days of the Long Riders. Yes. So you guys obviously formed formed a friendship, and you, you're you still recording with them and playing with them. That's that's kind of fun. That's a, a great band. I really, really love them. Yes, they are a great band. Very powerful. Steve is a very dear friend of mine. And uh, we've yeah been on a number of their albums. I'm lucky that he, he's invited me, you know, from their early days. And once again, they took a break and they kind of came back. So mm-hmm, right. Played on a few. Oh, their comeback album was so good. I love that album. Yeah. So, so good. Yeah, played on a few things with them in, in the early days. And actually, Steve, speaking of that, Steve nearly was a long rider. When I came down to audition for them with them, Steve was sitting there in this garage. I'm talking about a garage band. He was there in this garage <laughs> and, and he had played with them just, you know, maybe a night or two. And then I came in, right. and that's when he got the idea, well, it's supposed to be a guitar player in this band. I'm just going to go off and form the Dream Syndicate, or what became the Dream Syndicate. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the guys in the Flesh Tones, if you know that name, that band, they were they were in the garage also, New York, great New York, New York band. One reason I played on a lot of their records is because they've been, rec- <laughs> they've been recording them about a mile from where I live. Yeah, they all fly in. I could practically ride my bicycle over there. To where they record <laughs> with Adrian Olson or a studio called Montrose. Yeah, really fantastic group. I love those guys. Well, oh, that's really, really neat. So, you know, 22 years after Long Riders hung up their hats, you guys reunite. You, you're playing some shows. You record Psychedelic Country Soul. You know, what, what led up to that, to you guys making music together and playing music together again? Well, I was touching on this a little bit earlier, Brian. We played in New York City right after the election in 2016, and I was telling Sid, we've got to have some new material. And so we, yeah. we had some discussion you know, with Tom and Greg, and we all decided, all right, well, let's give it a go and see what we can do. And I was very confident that we would come up with a good record. You know, we're trading, you know, we're all living in different cities at this point. Greg is a native of Los Angeles. He's a big music publisher out there for 30 years, over 30 years. Tom was in the Midwest. I was in Virginia. Sid was in London. So we're sending song ideas back and forth, long distance. You know, we were able to come up with a group of songs that we felt good about. And we met up. We had our dear friend Ed Stasium. He was uh, the producer on that record, actually the last two records. And he was he produced one of our earlier albums also. So we met up in L.A. And we were actually, we were playing in L.A. We were playing at the Roxy. This is 2016, I guess. We were rehearsing at SIR, and an old friend of ours who had actually played in the band for a short time, Larry Chapman, he came by the studio, and he said, Stephen, hey, I just bought a recording studio. I was like, what? He's worked with Dr. Dre for 30 years. And so anyways, one thing led to another, and we ended up recording there. And uh, yeah, that became Psychedelic Country Soul, and um, that was recorded in 2017 in the fall, and the record didn't come out for a while later i guess it was released around february of 2019 but uh yeah that really kind of got us back in the game for for playing and having something new out 
it's, and I loved it because now we're not playing songs that are 30 years old. We're playing new material. Yeah. Now you guys have just released really a, a great new album, uh, September, November. And it, it's an album I think everybody should hear. It's, it's one I have really, really enjoyed. We're going to play a song from that album here in a minute. But so since you guys, you know, got together in the early eighties and, and, and now releasing this brand new album, how do you, how do you think you guys have maybe developed as, as writers and as a, as a band overall in those decades? Well, hopefully one gets more sort of fine tuned at their craft and, and you have a lot of experience and a lot of years have gone by and kind of have different themes you might be writing about from making records in your early twenties, mid twenties versus, you know, I'm in my mid sixties now. So you're reflecting a bit more now than, you know, than you, than you were when you were, when you were young, you didn't have that much, sure. didn't have a whole lot of life experience at that point. Let's play a song. Um, and I appreciate you guys letting us include this uh, in the podcast. We're going to listen to seasons change from the long writers, brand new album, September, November. <laughs> I, I really love that song. I, I think that song and Elmer Gantry is alive and well are probably my two favorite cuts right now. I really, really love both of those right. songs. Yeah. What can you tell us about uh, this song, Seasons Change? 
Well, Seasons Change, I think it's just a a song that's about longing kind of for a loved one who's not there. It's also about not only the seasons changing, but it's about time, years marching on. You know, once again, sort of about reflection or about friends who were, were here that maybe they're not here anymore, you know. And um, mm-hmm. so, yeah, it's just it's just about life and how things are evolving and seasons are changing and life's going by and a little bit of reflection there. Do you think as a, as a writer operating more on the, the country side of the music spectrum, as opposed to the straight, straightforward rock side, do you think that gives you an opportunity to, to tell stories a little bit differently? Um, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but you know, there, there's a, there's a way that stories are told and and they oftentimes are different based on the genre of it. But have you found that writing on the countryside has maybe given you that uh, different way to tell a story or maybe allows you to tell stories that perhaps you couldn't tell if you were maybe in a straight, straight ahead rock band? It's hard to answer that because I don't really feel like I'm a country artist, like in, in the modern sense of that word of it. And I don't really feel like a rock guy too, because that I feel like I'm in some in between part of those two genres. So I know what you're saying. I think if you think about the old classic, you know, honky tonk country western artists that I that I loved, you know, growing up, that yeah, that you could tell stories. All those songs were kind of story songs. Of course, there are songs, you know, about you know, if you look at the hardcore country artists, you know, George Jones or. Johnny Paycheck guy songs about cheating and drinking and all that, but they might be <laughs> some sort of uh, country narrative about you know relationships or whatever. Um, so I, I, I would I would mm-hmm. agree with that. I understand that you guys have a mention in the Western Edge, which kind of really highlights California's contribution to country music. Tell us a little bit about how you guys got involved in that, how you got that mention, and tell us a little bit about what that is. Yeah, so that's a great thing, Brian. We were we were mentioned in this exhibit that's now at the Country Music Hall of Fame, and it's called Western Edge. It's about country rock music and the beginnings of that in Los Angeles. And so it starts off with all the groups you'd expect, you know, the Birds and the Dillards and people like that, and uh, you know, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, Linda Ronstadt, Chris Hillman, all those guys, the Flying Burrito Brothers. Grant Parsons. And so it goes from, say, like the mid-60s through the mid-80s. And the scene, one of the scenes we spoke of earlier, this uh, Roots Rock scene in L.A. with Los Lobos and Rank and Pile and Blasters and all those groups, we were part of that. So I was quite pleased when they opened this exhibit and they have some of our song lyrics and the poster and, and the mention that we were part of that scene in L.A. because that really was something that was highly influential to us, you know, the, the burritos and Graham and Chris Hillman and, and all those groups. So that really informed a lot of what we did. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting down there this year to visit that, that exhibit will be up for a few years now, a few years going. Wow. How fun. That's really cool that you guys got, got that mention and it, and, and appropriately. So you guys were a very, very important part of that whole seat and, in, in launching a genre and, your contribution to that cannot be understated. So I'm glad you guys are getting some recognition for that. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it was very pleasing to be included. And it sort of validates your early work and that somebody was paying attention. So so as we kind of get near the end of our chat, tell us what's next, what's coming up for you, for the long riders. Um, you talked about some dates you'll be playing with Carla. Yeah, just kind of let us know what, what's coming up for you guys. Sure. So the long riders... Uh, We have a tour in uh, Europe, mid-May through early June. We're going to be in the UK, uh, some dates in England, a date in Scotland. We're going to, I think there's a date in uh, maybe in the Netherlands, and we head up to Scandinavia. And I've got some, a couple of shows I'm playing with Carla in LA. There's one next month, and there's a couple over the summer. Mm -hmm. And now those are more, well, one of them is a band date, but that's already sold out. Um, there's another Long Riders tour in the fall. It's more Southern uh, Europe, down to Spain, Italy. And then after that tour, uh, Carl and I are going to play some dates, some duo dates up in Scandinavia. So there's a lot going on this year. 
and you know going to be promoting these two records that I've done. I love the Long Riders. They're my brothers from, I mean, the band's been together over 40 years. So we're like a family, and uh, I can't wait to, to uh, get out there and play these new songs. And I'd say the same with the songs with Carla. Which is, I just love that material as well. I have not seen the Long Riders live, and everything I've read, all the videos I've seen, you guys are outstanding live. So that's something I need to change. I need to, if you guys come anywhere near central California or even down to LA, I'll have to come, come check you guys out. Cause that's, that's something I need to cross off my bucket list. And where can people go to get information about tour dates and upcoming news to kind of keep, keep pulse on things. We have some websites that I could put in our show description to send people to. There's longriders.com. There's, there's a, Facebook page. I'm the worst with social media. So Sid and Greg <laughs> and Carla, that they're all much better at that than I am, but I will, I will definitely send you the link that you can include. And so for everybody listening, I'll put all those links in the show notes uh, or in the podcast description. So you can just scroll down and click on those and get all that information you want. So, well, Steven, it's been really, really great having you on today. Thank you so much for sharing part of your journey with us. Yes, Brian, it's a pleasure. I appreciate the invite and, um, uh, please come out and see us if we're playing anywhere near you. Absolutely. I, I will. I, it's something I need to cross off my list. So I, I, I would love to see you guys live. And so, and thank you everybody for listening. I appreciate that. If you're a fan of Steven's work and all of his bands in various forms, his, even his solo albums, let others know that uh, there's a great slice of Americana waiting for them. If they're not familiar, please share this episode with your friends. You can like us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all those fun places. So, and all the links we've talked about will be available in the show description as well. So keep your bags packed and join us on our next journey to the stage. And that's a wrap. Bye.